Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful goodness. We pray for your presence in, us, in this class. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, this morning we're going to be studying the flowering and fading of the British Advent message. I'm not, I don't know if you're aware of it. Undoubtedly, if you've read your chapter for today, you would. And by the way, I don't know if I told you chapter 4 instead of 3. No, you didn't. And, and I don't have the syllabus out, so you've read the... You, you're ahead for next time. Good. But the flowering and fading of the British Advent movement, I, I, it was... Uh, uh, the British movement started about about three decades before the American under William Miller. And uh, in 1802, the Christian Observer was full of articles on, uh, on Daniel 7 uh, and, and on uh, Revelation 13 and uh, various others that have to do with 1260 days. And it was a common thing for them to assume that the days represented years. And in 1810, the, the, uh, by that time and before that time, the focus had shifted to the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14. And it was in 1910 that uh, John Brown promoted his concept that the 2300 days started in 457, and according to his figures, it should end at 1843. Now, that was pretty good calculating, because that's what it would have been if there had been a zero date. But when you go from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D., you, you lose a year. It should go 1 B.C., 0, 1 A.D. And that would bring us to 1844. So John Brown in 1810. In 1812, the, the uh, book by, uh, that, by the pen name Ben Ezra, and uh, actually his real name was Manuel Lacunza, yeah. who had been writing for, I think, about 30 years, and never did stop and correct anything, but he just kept writing a fairly large book, which changed views somewhat as he went along, but he didn't go back and, and, and make the corrections. So you just have to read the latter part in order to know what his view was at the end. But he went by the name Ben Ezra because he didn't want anyone. He was a Jesuit. And he certainly didn't want anyone to know what he had written because he was identifying the Pope as the Antichrist. But he did not go on a day for a year basis. He took a day for a day, which meant that he was dealing with a completely different system. And this would be the introduction of futurism. Now, where did he get this method of, of calculating? From his own church. Because in about uh, uh, two, uh, over two centuries before, uh, uh, a Catholic uh, priest had introduced the idea of, of futurism in order to counteract Luther's historicism and Calvin and so forth. That was the partisan view that the Roman Catholic Church was the Antichrist. Now, it was uh, th then the Catholics developed two different types of prophecy. One was Preterism, which meant that all the prophecies were fulfilled 
of Daniel before Christ came and of Revelation in the time of the apostolic period. And the room was like the opposite. Pardon? The room was like the opposite. Yes. So, he followed the day for a day. However, he identified the Pope. Uh, uh, a, no, he didn't identify the Pope, but a, a ranking prelate, a Catholic prelate, which undoubtedly he understood to be the Pope, but was careful not to identify it. But at any rate, he identified uh, a, a Catholic prelate as the future, not past, but future uh, Antichrist. It was in 1826 that Edward Irving finished a 120, 194 page introduction to that book and also translated it into English. 1912. In that same year, Darby was a guest in uh, Irving's home. And uh, maybe I better not bring this yet because it just it shifts a bit. Yes? Did Irving write the introduction to uh, Manuel's book? Yes. 194 page. That's a big, that's a, that's a book in itself. Mm. It shows that he was very interested in it. Now, a little later on in our class, uh, we will come back to this, but uh, in the meantime, let's go back to, to something else. Uh, let's uh, take a look at what was happening in 1832. George Mueller and Henry Craik began to uh, work together as the two ministers of, of a little church in England, which provided them a very meager salary. But George and Henry decided that that was not uh, according to scripture, and they rejected any salary. Because the way the salaries worked in those times, the rich people paid for their seats, the good seats in the church. And, and, and they actually paid for them, and the poor people had to sit in uh, other quarters which were not so desirable. And they decided that was a violation of scripture in the first place, when the people paid for their seats, they were not contributing. And therefore, they were de deprived of the, uh, of the uh, opportunity of, of offerings. And the second place, and really I should put it first because that was the main thing, is that they were showing respect to the rich and the poor were being uh, by contrast neglected and disrespected. So they decided they would propose to the church that instead of a salary they would simply receive contributions as the people voluntarily decided to contribute and that that contribution would be, play, uh, would be made not by an offering collection, but by simply when they wanted to contribute, there was a place they could contribute. But this would not be something that the church was asking for. It's something the members would be impressed to do. As a result, they received much more than they would have if they had received their, the amount for the, for the pews, and they call it pew rental, so they had to do it every, every month. They'd have to rent the pews. And, uh, but at any rate, what happened was that it wasn't very long before 
George's wife began to recognize that there were many young ladies who were orphans and they needed care. She began taking care of them. First thing you know, as they took them into their home, they overflowed, so they built an orphanage. And then it overflowed, so they built another orphanage. And it overflowed, so they built another. And actually they built five large orphanages in, in, altogether. And they had cared for, I see it says 2,000, I think it was 3,000, I don't know how the two managed to get there, my finger must have hit the wrong key. 3,000 orphans that they cared for. Now, thing I want to share with you about the orphanages is that they were operated, and this is a very important thing to note, they were operated without any uh, requests for funds. They were operated by faith, and that was an important thing to them. Now, I'm telling you about this because George Mueller represented the brethren concepts. The Holy Spirit was to do all of the organizing. They had no organization. They, they just simply operated as the Lord helped them every day. In fact, they were dependent from day to day on things that, you know, something that would be given them to operate on. Uh, so I, I mention this because this was a, a Plymouth, I mean, this was a brethren concept that only the Holy Spirit guides. Now, the fact is, there is nothing in Scripture to indicate that organization is wrong. But they had the idea that if you organize at all, you become Babylon. Now, it is important to notice that God honors faith whether the person is, has the right understanding or not. And God blessed George Mueller and his wife as they ministered to the orphans. They gave themselves to this project. But that doesn't mean that God wants to leave us where we are. And we're going to discuss now, we're going to discuss the brethren thinking and issues. They believed that any was Babylon. I see I have the misspelling of Babylon. They were to be guided only by the Holy Spirit. And that meant that they weren't even to plan their sermons. They, were to, they didn't even plan who was to speak. They would come together and as the Lord impressed one of them, they would speak. So, uh, and they had a false concept of the second angel's message. They interpreted the second angel's message come out of Babylon to mean that there should be no organization come out of organization which they identified with Babylon. And uh, what happened was that the result was an intense autocratic, uh, can I go back? Uh, see, did it come back? Yeah, all right. But uh, the result, and you'll find this in your textbook by the way, the result was that the, when, when God gave his gifts, the gifts of the Spirit include the gift of leadership. And it is God's purpose that we be organized, not disorganized. So what happened was that instead of organization, we had a czar. Because... J. N. Darby took it upon himself to see to it that these rules were followed. Whenever a leader developed, because leaders will develop. If you had a group of people out on the, on the desert and suddenly found themselves there, there would become a, some kind of organization, would automatically. Certain individuals would show 
aptitude toward leading the group and they would be followed by the individuals whether anyone said they were leading or whether they didn't. So what happened in, in the Plymouth and the Brethren movement was that certain people became leaders and when anyone appeared to be a leading position Darby then considered his duty to to destroy their leadership. Either either uh, somehow get them to to refuse to to a leader group or remove them from from the movement. As a result of this he uh, decided that a Benjamin Newton was violating this principle. Now Benjamin Newton was a scholar who's known even today and uh, this man was, was said of him, he was a man whose learning, ability and piety outshone all others of England. He was an outstanding person. So what did he do? He automatically excommunicated him and that meant that he removed them from the Brethren Fellowship. He had no right to fellowship. And any group who would fellowship him, then he would excommunicate the whole group. Now, I mentioned Mueller a minute ago. And uh, Mueller was one, and one of the leaders of the Bethesda group. In fact, I mentioned about he and Craig being the two ministers. Well, they fellowshiped Newton. As a result, uh, Darby threatened to disfellowship the whole uh, uh, group, which, by the way, was, was I, I should tell you how he dealt with, with Newton first. Actually, Newton was the acknowledged leader of his little group, uh, not because he chose to lead, but because people wanted him to help them. And uh, so Darby went to Plymouth where Newton was and started another group and demanded that the people in Newton's group uh, remove him. And when they refused to remove him, he developed his own group and eventually after a year or so of his attacking uh, Newton and making false claims, uh, eventually the people um, uh, left Newton and went to his group. So that meant that Newton was effectively disfellowshipped. But when he went to the Bethesda group, then they threatened to disfellowship the whole Bethesda group. Now, it is of interest what it was that um, there were uh, doctrinal beliefs that, uh, that he held. By the way, I'm, I'm not finding the one I wanted. Uh, there was uh, doctrinal differences. And uh, he demanded that Newton give up these beliefs. First of all, uh, Newton uh, was rejecting Darby's dispensational doctrine, which we will discuss in a little bit, uh, which uh, became known as dispensationalism. He denied the secret rapture which Darby was teaching. He denied the doctrine of church discipline, which Darby was if enforcing, and that is that one church can disfellowship another church. Or, or actually disfellowship individuals or prevent them from uh, taking that person into fellowship. And uh, Newton was opposed uh, to these things. So intensely, here, here we have, so intensely was Darby opposed to Newton that when Newton finally surrendered theologically uh, and by there's one I didn't put down here, uh, which I should, and I will mention it, and it has to do with the nature of Christ. 
Uh, finally, uh, Newton abandoned his view on that, but even then, Darby was not satisfied, and he insisted that the Bethesda group should get rid of him, move him out, and not allow him to be a part of the fellowship. And when they failed to do so, they disfellowshipped. The Beth he disfellowshipped the whole Bethesda group, which was larger than his own. But nevertheless, he was, he was the czar. You see, when we fail to follow God's plan, Satan is able to create great confusion. So the concept of organization being Babylon, the concept that we must not have in leaders and so forth, is really contrary to Scripture, not according to Scripture. Now, what were the uh, various views that uh, Darby taught? That those, you'll find those in the Schofield Reference Bible. And they have to do with predestination. Every man is predestined before he's ever born to be not only lost or saved, but many people go f further and they say everything in their lives are predestined. And this is what we call determinism, that God determines a person's destiny. So you, according to scripture, you choose and over and again, the Bible says, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. There are many times when the Bible shows that we must make choices. It's our choices that determine our destiny, not God's. Someone has said that uh, uh, God is for us and Satan is against us and it's our vote as to who's going to win, Satan or God. And as a result of predestination, the concept of once saved, always saved. If you're truly saved, you can't be lost. Why? Because you're predestined. So, and then the uh, repudiation of a day for a year. Uh, getting back to the story of the uh, of Edward Irving's translating the book and so forth. Just about the time he finished the translation and his introduction, uh, at that time Darby came as a guest in his home, and that he came there as a result of a series of meetings that would meet every year, a prophetic meetings that would meet every year in the home of Henry Drummond, who was a wealthy banker who was really the one who bankrolled the Protestant, I mean, the Advent message for, for it to go. And every year from, from 1826 to 1830, they held regular meetings there. And it was in that context that Darby was in Edward Irving. So they took this concept of Manuel Kunz's back to the conference and the conference decided that while historicism was, the, was true, that maybe futurism was also true. In other words, a day for a year, and they thought, well, let's, let's study carefully to see if there's also a day for a day. They did not intend to give up a day for a year principle which brought the earlier, you know, wood to 18, uh, that is 457 B.C. to 1843. They had no intention to begin with. But when you start working on futurism, you're working on the Roman Catholic counterfeit of historicism. The result was they became confirmed futurists and repudiated the day for a year and repudiated the idea that the Pope was the Antichrist. So they actually, it, it destroyed and changed the whole thing. Now, as far as dispensationalism, Darby taught that there were seven dispensations and we were saved in different ways in each of those seven 
once and the two main dispensations would be the Jewish and the Christian. So the last two, so the Jewish dispensation would last until Christ and the Apostles. So that would begin a new dispensation which was to last for as long as the Gentile period it was. But this is what introduced that gap period. In the 70 week prophecy, which they had been studying along the 2300 days and is the basis for arriving at 1843 or 44, when they were studying that, Darby suggested that the 69 weeks were continuous until Christ. And when Christ came, introduced the Gentile period, then the 70th week was cut off. This is called the gap theory. A gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. And there's no specific time, just whenever the Gentiles uh, period was over. Then, that. now how do we know when the 70th week, well Darby taught, uh, the secret rapture would take place. When the secret rapture took place, it was to remove all of the Christians who were ready to go, and they would be raptured into heaven, and the rest would be given another trial, and the Jews would be given another opportunity, and therefore the Jewish dispensation would start again, and at that moment when the rapture took place, the last week would start again. And the last week would last for seven years. You see, this is a, would be the day for, for well, actually a, a week, seven days, yes, which, which would be a, a year, a, a years. So this was the principle they followed now, all the, that is uh, Darbyism and uh, determinism with the dispensationalism penetrated all the churches. Seventh-day Adventists, however, had protection because we were strong believers in a day-for-a-year principle and we were, our whole movement was based on the idea of uh, the 2300 starting in 18, uh, 457 and ending in 1844. However, in spite of our protection, in, the 19, in 1970, uh, Brinsmead and Ford were converted to futurism by a, a leading, uh, by uh, Paxton, who was a Plymouth Brethren uh, uh, professor in a college. Hmm. And it was Ford on October 27, 1979, who publicly repudiated our doctrine of 1844 and of, uh, well, our whole sanctuary doctrine. And uh, I was at Angwin. I happened to be in Fresno at the time, uh, actually with, a, with an Australian, and Des is an Australian, but I was with another Australian who was recording my sanctuary series at Bakersfield. But actually I lived up there, what I call on the hill, that is at Angwin area, and would have been present in his lecture if I had not been in Bakersfield. But as soon as they got back, and I knew the lecture was going to take place because it was advertised quite widely and was anxious to find out what he presented. So as soon as they got back, I uh, checked about it and found out that he had indeed repudiated openly. Until that time, Des had insisted that he still believed in the sanctuary doctrine and uh, that he taught it, and etc. But... Uh, Many of his students for years were saying that he taught the opposite. And now, uh, in October 27, he came out publicly and, and presented that. So, by this time, before his lecture, 
he had penetrated Adventism quite deeply, especially the intellectual uh, side of Adventism, so that there were many uh, pastors and some teachers who uh, became involved with Ford and chose to follow him when he was removed from office and so forth. Uh, some of them were removed from their offices as well. And I guess that is the end of, oh, no one told me. Oh, wait a minute, wait. Oh, we have lots of time. That's right. I was wondering where that time had gone. But uh, this morning's was more of a story. So we'll take time now for discussion that you may have. Um, I was a little distracted this morning because we've been pressed trying to get the, the video that is the PowerPoint fixed and so forth. And I've rushed through it, I guess. At any rate, what would you like to, to discuss? Yeah, well, uh, I would be interested in that time when Desmond Ford, he repudiated, as you said, um, how can that happen? And what were his influences? Because you were there, it's not just you know, history for you, it's your experience. All right, let me tell you a little bit about the history beyond what I've shared so far. I gave a bare bones history this morning, <laughs> but I'll give you a little more and you can ask other questions. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, Ford and Brinsmead, I'm going to go back to uh, my first meeting of, of Robert Brinsmead. I was pastoring in the Okanagan Church. I was in connection with a man who took Brinsmead around to the different places when he did come from Australia. I found out later what I, I didn't know, but what uh, Al Hudson had invited Brinsmead to come. I found out later he had told him to stay until he worked things out with the General Conference. Al Hudson and I were involved in a wrestling match at the time. I had been for some time and I had a, a, probably a file that thick of correspondence between us. And he was trying to uh, convert me, and I was trying to convert him. Al Hudson was a printer, an Adventist printer in Baker, Oregon, who had taken theology but did not receive a call. So here he is as a printer, but he has very strong, uh, you know, desires to see that the denomination is transformed. And as a result is, at the very time I'm talking about, he was probably the denomination's greatest burr in its saddle. In other words, he, he needled the, the denomination because uh, he, he was aware of various problems within the denomination. The fact is, uh, young people, we don't solve a denomination's problem by uh, uh, by publishing all kinds of things, uh, uh, t telling about all the problems. And, uh, and yet, Al was really, really a, a good man and really tried to work with the General Conference, so he didn't want Br Robert Brinsmead to come until he could arrange to have a meeting with the General Conference officers. And he was hoping that that would work. But, uh, but uh, as I remember, even before, when I first heard the name Robert Brinsmead was from D Al Hudson. And Al Hudson had been working very hard. He wanted to me to be his preacher, that is, to join in his cause. And, 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 uh, and I wanted him to adopt different methods. Uh, our our thinking was quite a bit alike, but the fact is he had a very different method of going about it than I was able to prove because it, it went contrary to the counsels that I understood from the spirit of prophecy. So 
it was from him. He was very excited when he heard about Robert Brinsmead. Well, when, at that time, Brinsmead was causing quite an uproar in Australia. And that was delightful to Al because uh, Brinsmead was forming his own group, you know, and, and so forth. So, but I next heard of Brinsmead when I heard a, I got a telephone call one morning. Al Hudson was on the other line and he said, Leroy, um, I have John, uh, Robert and John Brinsmead with me here at the motel. And I wonder if you'd come down and listen to them. And John was Robert's older brother, a couple of years older. But Robert was a spokesman. So I went to Tenasket. I lived in Oroville, about 17 miles away. So I drove down there to listen. I listened to Robert Brinsmead for more than two hours, I'm sure. I did not interrupt him at any time or even ask him questions because I wanted him to finish what he was doing and then I thought we would enter into discussion. Well, when he finished and he gave a tremendously uh, excellent presentation from Bible, Spirit Prophecy, and, uh, but there was a problem that I could see and that is that he completely omitted one area that would be very important. He dealt with justification, which, by the way, takes place as a result of the cross. So we think of that as located in, in, in the cross. And then he dealt with the most holy place, the judgment. He did not deal with the holy place. Had nothing to say about it. So when he finished, I said, Bob, I have just one question. Why didn't you link the holy place with the, between the cr cross and the most holy place? He answered me with two words, one being a contraction of two words. That's legalism. With that, he was gone. Not one other word except Plenty of, of, of preaching, but no discussion. That's legalism. What I didn't know, and I would be de discovering, is that his theology to begin with was what we call a, a pacifist theology. His theology is that you go into the most holy place by faith, which Ellen White calls for, but his idea is that you wait there until God suddenly removes your, your, your sinful nature. Just, just like that. Then you're sealed. Cannot sin. Uh, much of his theology was excellent. But the root of his theology was false. He did not base it upon a proper understanding of the nature of man. God does not suddenly remove our, our carnal nature. That will be removed when Jesus comes. But that is not the key to the perfection that God is planning for his people. Now, interestingly enough, those who opposed Desmond, for, I mean, Robert Brinsmead, actually believed the same error that he believed. But they went the wrong, about opposite direction with it. So what was it they believed? That it is impossible to live without sin in a sinful nature. Which meant that if we are to live without sin, we must have our nature removed. Now, we will have our nature removed at Christ's coming, and we will live without sin. But that is not the key to the sealing that God has planned for his people. God intends to seal his people with the seal of the Holy Spirit. We won't take time for 
detailed discussion of that right now, but the seal of God must take place before the latter rain falls. Now, according to Robert Brinsmead, this would be triggered by the removal of the se sinful nature at during probationary time. Then the individuals will be sealed and go out and preach the gospel and latter rain power. But this is not according to scripture. Um, this led Brinsmead, however, to be vulnerable to Paxton. And I'm going to move forward now another uh, several years because this, uh, what I'm telling you about was 1961. So if you move forward nearly a decade, and Brinsmead is now in Australia again, and he's presenting messages on the airwaves and a man by the name of Jeffrey Paxton, who was a professor in a, a school there, whose theology was Plymouth Brethren, contacted Brinsmead and said, I would like to have you come over to discuss some of the issues. When Brinsmead got there, he insisted on, on, on uh, presenting his own pacifist view, that is, the Plymouth Brethren. At any rate, they had more in common than Brinsmead had with Adventism, and so at, uh, it was at that point that Brinsmead became a Plymouth Brethren, still called himself Sunday Adventist, but it was Plymouth Brethren. Now, at this time, Brinsmead was caring for Desmond Ford's dying wife, who was dying of cancer. And so, as Ford would visit in his home, visit his wife, he would also talk with Brinsmead. And it was in this way that he became involved with Paxton. And as a result, he became very interested in the Plymouth Brethren view. And when his wife did die, his first wife, he decided to go to England and study under the world-renowned F.F. Bruce, Plymouth Brethren, the, the most, probably the most famous of all Plymouth Brethren. So Ford studied under Plymouth, uh, under F.F. Bruce and uh, secured his doctorate. In that doctrine, doctorate, he did a dissertation which has developed into the book Daniel. Have you, have you seen that? Yeah. Some of you have. Well, the book Daniel is a halfway book. He still pre presents historicism and gives some pretty good evidences for it. But at the same time, he's suggesting that futurism may be also true. And so he is actually presenting uh, the view of his major professor as well as his own view. And I do not know at what point he transferred, but uh, he did the same thing Darby did and, and his group. Young people, you cannot flirt and, with light and darkness. You can't bring them together. Futurism operates on a completely different basis. And if people who have a, a um, historicist view, which a historicist means a consecutive history of Daniel from his time clear on to the end. That's what we mean by historicist. Actually, Plymouth Brethren claim to unite all three. Futurism, historicism, and futurism. I mean, preterism, historicism, and futurism. In reality, they identify everything Daniel says in a preterist way, so that it took place according to them before Christ ever came. 
and what Revelation teaches they put into the future. And what they do is to claim, of course, that it started way back there and continues now, so they would call that historicism. But in reality, historicism is based on a year for a day principle which they repudiate. So they repudiate historicism out of hand. It's not a combination of the three, but it does bring together the two of them. But their focus is on, on the future. The denial of the papacy as being the Antichrist and the identification of some future Jew who, who will uh, now... Um, the view of uh, Ben Ezra was that this was a Catholic prelate. Darby's view is it's a Jew. So some future Jew, Jewish leader, would make a, 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 a compact and then would violate it and so forth. But that's something we won't take time to discuss. That's, that's there. But we did need to discuss Plymouth Brethrenism because it is impacting Adventism even to this day. Although Desmond Ford was removed from his position and his credentials were removed, the fact is that he, even now, his theology controls too much of, of uh, academic Adventist thinking and it filters down in many cases into the, the church itself and to the pews. Now, I, I've given you a sweep that I was planning to have a paper for you and I haven't been able to find it. I was looking for it too this morning. I don't know where that paper is. It would tell you the history of what I've just told you. Um, what specific ways is Ford's theology being seen today in the church? Where is it seen? Like well, we well, I hate to say it, but it, it penetrates many of our, of our colleges. No. Many of our, I should say, it penetrates colleges because of certain professors. In most cases, it's not known because they have learned to use different terms and so forth. But, but it's there. Uh, the undermining of our sanctuary mm -hmm. message, 1844 and so forth. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I was going to ask if that theology, like what terms they do use, like what specifically are they presenting that is in well, Ford? Well, like Desmond Ford's Ford? focus was on, um, his primary focus was on justification by faith as taking place legally at the cross. <coughs> now, another group of Adventists have emphasized justification at the cross, but they are not to be confused with Darby and, 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 and with Des Ford. Actually, they intend this view to, a means, to be a means of accepting truth that he had in denying the error, but it's error that they, they have inadvertently accepted. Now, did I get off what you were saying? Did I get that? Uh, your question? Any other questions? Who was Darby again? Darby, John N. Darby was the watchdog of the Plymouth Brethren. And by the way, why are they called Plymouth Brethren? Because he established a second group in Plymouth and drove out it's Newton. Out and therefore, uh, what he did when he uh, excommunicated the, uh, the other Bethesda group. And by the way, Newton had already actually repudiated his own theological position in order to, you know, in order to accommodate, but even so, Darby still excommunicated them. Uh, so that there are two brethren, uh, there's the open brethren, which follow Bethesda, and the closed brethren, which follow Darby and the Plymouth Brethren. So when we speak of Plymouth Brethren, we're not referring to 
open brethren. However, I need to discuss that a little bit with you. You remember, we were talking about organization. It's dangerous for us to develop doctrines that are not in Scripture. The Bible teaches that Christ, when he left, gave gifts into man. One of those gifts was the gifts of leadership. When we reject any of his gifts, we may be in very serious trouble. And uh, it is a rejection of the gift of leadership and organization. By the way, leadership requires some kind of organization, doesn't it? And uh, it is a rejection of the, of the gift of leadership and organization that resulted in their having sought to reestablish. They were trying to reestablish priesthood of believer principles. But instead of establishing it, they, they developed a most intensely autocratic, czar-controlled organization which had to break apart in order for any of them to be free and called open. But even they were controlled by the theology. So, so both of them followed the same theology. Uh, Darby was so strong a personality that he has dominated both groups theologically. But it was organizationally that they were broken into two groups. Any other questions? So is that how, is this how like futurism is, is a, in our church today? Like, well, it, the know. futurism came through Desmond Ford mm -hmm. and brings me down Desmond Ford, by the way. But by that time, did, uh, Robert Brinsmead was not impacting the Adventist church too largely. He was at, at, there were Adventist followers who were in contact with him, but it was Ford mainly that uh, penetrated Adventism with Plymouth Brethren doctrine. And we will probably deal with Plymouth Brethren problems till, till the Lord comes. Uh, those basically, it's a rebellion against the uh, uh, against <clears throat> 2300 day message of Daniel 8.14. Yeah. So, any other questions? That The book that we are uh, following, which is one of our textbooks, uh, The Power of Humility, is extremely important because uh, it is a book that deals with principles underlying organization, priesthood of believer principles. And if we are going to be sealed, we must be united. For us to be united, it must be united on principles of priesthood of believers. It doesn't matter whether we go to rejecting organization and disorganization or whether we go to the opposite, the results are pretty much the same and that is autocratic government. Notice the, the uh, development of the Roman Catholic Church and especially under Constantine that's before the actual full development but the change of the church to mirror that of the the nation with the Pope uh, and the Emperor on top, that in itself resulted in an authoritarian government in which the responsibility of the people is not to think but to obey, not to exercise their conscientious convictions but to obey a th human authority. The Pope its authority was transferred down to the College of Cardinals and the Cardinals authority was transferred to the archbishops and to the bishops, to the lowly priests and then to this voiceless people. Now, it was Darby's desire to get back to a priesthood of believer plan, but Although they made the attempt to do so, they did so on a false basis of denying 
the role that they had and claiming the whole thing was the Holy Spirit's role. In other words, the plan that God has given to us is a union of the Holy Spirit and the human will. And God honors the human will. And therefore, we are to exercise our wills and we are to organize and it is the Holy Spirit working through the body but it works through the body, through the human will, not against the human will, and not instead of the human will. In other words, we unite with him, and he guides us. But he doesn't do the organization, he guides us to do the organization, organizing. Now we have before us today some real problems in our denomination, because there are many who insist that women must be organized, or uh, ordained and they feel that so strongly they're willing to do almost anything to get women's organization uh, women's ordination passed now the general conference has met several times and has decided that at least at that time not to ordain women but two of our unions today Columbia Union and Pacific Union where we are right now have decided that they must break with the General Conference, violate their uh, position, and ordain women. So what does that do to us? It, it, uh, it puts us in conflict with the General Conference. So this can be a very serious thing once whole unions of the North American division begin to break away in terms of authority. It is God who designed that the authority of the church reside in the General Conference through a representative system uh, from the churches to the conferences, re sending representatives from conferences and unions and divisions, so forth, that uh, we make decisions and honor the General Conference's choice. But once there's a rejection of General Conference counsel, then anyone is open to become independently independent. In other words, it's an in indication. And overseas, many of the overseas divisions from time to time have wanted to go a different direction, but they've honored the General Conference. At this point, it is my anticipation that there will be some breaking away in other divisions, and there may be no end to it. And it may be that the Lord will stop the chain reaction and maybe he'll permit it. But one thing I want to say is that if God permits it, he will do so for a purpose. And we should not be dismayed. Because as we sow, so shall we reap. And God may have decided, or may decide, that our sowing has been sufficient that we need to reap the results. But he will hold his hand over things, and his work will be finished. And he will have a representative group who will reveal his character. But that representative group will be a united group. And it's extremely important for us to understand the importance of unity. We should not compromise in order to unite. Compromise actually breeds division. But we should be as earnest about unity as we are about truth. And when we focus on unity and truth and bring these together, God will bless us and we will have both. Any other questions? Well, it may be that you can use the time for for reading the chapter we've just gone through before your next class. So shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Guide and direct us, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.